Our, no our next guest is a good friend of the show. Sarah Orleski spent 14 years at TSN as the Winnipeg Bureau reporter, and she now has a front row seat to the Central Division leading Winnipeg Jets. She is their senior host and producer, and we're proud to welcome her to the DFO Rundown. Sarah, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. Yeah, no, great to chat with you. And let's start there with the job change. Uh, big deal for you leaving TSN, not only covering the Jets and hosting uh, Jets on TSN, but also spent many years on the CFL sidelines and covering the Grey Cup as well. What's the transition been like? Uh, you know what? It's been great. It's obviously been different. Um, I'm not going to lie. I might have shed a few tears during the playoffs during for CFL. It just was so different to be warm and inside watching from my couch as opposed to um, being on the sidelines. So I joke, I even wore a toque for one of the games just so that I could still feel as if I had a little bit um, of a part in it, but it's been, it's been good. It's been uh, reinvigorating as well and being able to work with some fantastic people. I mean, obviously I did at TSN, but then now with, the Jets as well. And this is an organization and a team that I'm obviously very familiar with having covered them since their first day in Winnipeg. Yeah. And, and now you are literally on the inside in terms of watching it all come together. And you picked a really intriguing and interesting season to step into that. Um, you know, I think a lot of people were curious watching this team from afar. What would this be like you know not a ton of change roster wise but pretty significant changes um off the ice in terms of blake wheeler no longer being the team's captain rick bonus comes in as an experienced head coach uh after you know paul maurice and dave lowry that crew and and frankly the assistant coaches had been there for a very long time um a big change off the ice and i think people are saying well what is this team are they going to be a playoff team are they not and they've really come together in an interesting way. What's it? What what stands out to you from the first quarter of the season from the Jets as you watched? I think that what stands out most is just the environment is around and the mood around the team. Obviously, I mean, winning cures all, and and so everybody's been in a good mood. But I didn't know what to expect going into this season. As you mentioned not a lot of changes on the ice. And so I think that able to look at, you could look at it two ways, depending which way you could either say that last year going into the season, so many people had high expectations for the Jets. They obviously did not deliver on it, but the same group largely brought back this year. So the potential could be there for it. And they've been able to come together. The, the job that Rick Bonus and this coaching staff have done and what they have tried to implement from even before training camp started with Rick reaching out to the players and really trying to get a sense of this team. And then they've dealt with, I mean, they've dealt with adversity. They've dealt with changes as well. Like so many teams, I mean, they have, they've had a number of key players injured. They just got Morgan Barron back, but they've had three of their top nine players sideline front and they've had different players step up and different roles and really bought in but it's the energy around this team is the biggest difference that I noticed for it there's lots of laughs there's smiles there's just it's a different feeling and granted we haven't been in the dressing room for a couple of seasons because of everything with COVID but it is a different feeling in that dressing room now than when we were in there uh, a couple of years ago or being around this team so it's been great to see uh, and I think that it's been able to pay off so far for them obviously on the ice one of the big changes and maybe the major change was of course removing the captaincy from Blake mm -hmm. Wheeler. And, you know, that could have went two ways. So I gave him a lot of credit, but has it been a benefit for him, Sarah? Is he more relaxed? Is, is doing less? Is that better for him? I think you could definitely look at it that way. There's a, we often hear people speak about the challenges and just the expectations that go along with being not, only a captain in the team, but a captain a Canadian market as well. And it, you know, Blake was one that was expected to obviously to speak to them. So we don't speak to him to the same extent that we did before, but I think he's able to go out and really just play, maybe be a little bit freer. It's been great for the group to be able to expand that leadership group for more players to have that voice. You know, even when speaking with about different features that we're looking at doing, they take it to the group and so there just seems to be 
that group mentality for it, as opposed to just having that, that one captain and that leader. And, and I think that it's, I think that it's been great for this group. You've seen other players that even though they were leaders beforehand, and make no mistake, I mean, Blake continues to lead on and off the ice. It's, he still obviously has a, a key presence in that leadership group, but to be able to spread it around a little bit more, uh, I think that it is, it's really benefited him as well as others within the group because they needed to expand that leadership group and they needed other players to feel that they had a voice and that they had responsibility with it as well. They've been in a lot of close games and the one area of their game that has really you know, catapulted them to where they're at in the stand is their ability to win in overtime. They're six and one, they lead the NHL, the most overtime wins with six, which is significantly more than anybody else. What is it about their three on three play that's so good this year? Well, they obviously, I mean, you look at the high end talent uh, that they have with it. They also have, to be honest, they also have a goaltender that's returned to Vesna like form with it and has been a key part um, of this equation. And they their success. I just, I think that the way that, and that players have not only been rolling, but the way that Rick Bonus sometimes has utilized them has just really paid off. And this is a group that we have not seen panic. You mentioned all the overtimes with with it and they've had adversity and you just look at the last week even when uh, not in terms of extra time but in terms of getting to that that third period where we've seen six on fives where the leads and this there just isn't panic in this group and I think that we've seen a number of different players be able to step up be able to um, show that offensive skill and when we look at that roster for it. I think that you look at the high end talent that exists there, the three on three, they've got a lot of speed. They've got a lot of confidence with it right now. And you've seen a number of different players step up. It isn't just Kyle Connor. It isn't just Mark Shifley. They've been getting contributions across the board. Yeah. And one of the big contributors has been Josh Marcy, three game winning goals, tying a career high. What the heck has happened to Josh Marcy? 23 <laughs> points in 20 games, his previous career high. 37 like we're only a quarter of the way into the year where did this offensive explosion come from uh the home of josh norrissey as they joke about uh, here in, in winnipeg now for it he is certainly you know i mentioned the the difference that it's been under rick bonus and just the the way that these systems are have been implemented the encouragement he wanted that blue line to get more involved with it we know the offensive Abilities that Josh Morrissey has throughout his junior career. We've seen it at different points, but we didn't see it as much in, in re recent seasons. And I think that he has that freedom right now to be able to jump in and play. He's encouraged to do it for it. And he's taken advantage of it. You look at the speed that he had on that last overtime goal and with just that ability to break out and to the speed. We hadn't seen it on display in recent years. Again, I think that they're being encouraged to do that a lot more now. And he's just, he is flourishing um, under Rick Bonus in this system right now. And it's great to see because I think that that's one of the things that Josh was known for earlier on in his career or had the ability for. So to be able to see him put it on display, I mean, obviously helps his confidence and is paying off for the Jets as well. Yeah, he had that offensive flair in Prince Albert, but didn't really see it at all in the NHL level. And I think we kind of thought of him as a shutdown guy for the longest time. So it's been fascinating to watch that. But I'm curious, if not Josh Morrissey, so he probably takes the cake. Who, what other player do you think has benefited the most from uh, the difference in, in structure and coaching change? Oh, good question. You know what? I, I mean, you could look at, I wouldn't even go there top six. I'd say that there's, it's just kind of being across the board. And, and I know that that's kind of being Switzerland and staying right on the fence with it, but you've just seen a number of, of different players step up um, and be given roles and be given um, more opportunity than maybe what we saw in the past with it. I think that this is a, this is a group right now that Rick bonus isn't afraid to, he's had to adjust partly because of any, He's had to adjust his lineup, give different opportunities, different players. But I think that you've seen players step up and make the most of their opportunities. He's really, he's tried to not shorten the bench. He's tried to go with the four line. So you've seen, 
you know, in that bottom six, you've seen players that have been waiting for their opportunity to step in, uh, be able to do it. And, and you look at players that uh, beyond your top six, you look at players, me in that third and that fourth line that have really, mm-hmm. even just in the very, and I granted, they're very small sample size, as even though, you know, we're looking a quarter of the way through the season, it's still only 20 games. And a number of these players haven't played 20 games, but when they've been given the opportunity uh, you know, in the last couple of games, someone that's really caught the eye of people in this market has been Mikey Acemont and the job that he's done. Um, just he, Rick even gave him the confidence, put him on the, they put him on the second power play unit last game. They've just given him opportunities and he's thrived under it. So I think that you've seen a number of players step up that role. He hasn't been afraid to mix it up. And his big message has always been that you need to earn your playing time and so it isn't just given to you and so I think that that's something that you know we didn't always see here in the past I think that um, certain players obviously given their um, role in the team were given more ice time regardless of how they were playing I think that now you feel everybody again feeling as if they they play that important role and that they will have the opportunities if they uh, go out there and perform and we've seen it so far and this is a group that cannot just have those top two lines going Kyle Connor although he's gotten on a roll now you think about how he got off to a slow start in terms statistically the shots were there the goals weren't though so for him uh, for this team to have success they can't just rely on their top six they need all four lines going and I think that that's what we've been able to see so far uh, under this new coaching staff 20 games into the season and the, the one player you talk about, you know, Kyle Connor off to a slow start, Nikolai Ehlers basically hasn't played all, all season long. That, that guy was a lock as, you know, a very good productive player for, for the Jets for, for many years. And, uh, you know, I, I think that speaks to, to them having, you know, next man up kind of mentality. And, and every team always has that mentality, Sarah, but it doesn't always come to fruition. Right. So who, who yes. do you feel like who has stepped up in his absence that maybe you did that they didn't expect to? Well, I think that, you know, you look at, they've had to, they've adjusted um, and they've had to rotate different players through uh, because of that. And you mentioned this was the season in which Nikolai Ehlers was expected to be on that top line, right? wing, And that this was, you know, for so many years, we had seen Mark Scheifele and Blake Wheeler kind of paired together on that top line. This was Nikolai Ehlers' opportunity, gets injured. And you think about the, not only the offensive output that he could have, but just how dynamic he is on the ice and how much it, how much of that offense can be helped along by him. So they've tried different players up there. I mean, we've seen, um, we've seen a rotation of players go up through there, including Sam Gagne, who I mean, you love him. Probably should not be on the, should not be playing on your top line um, at this point in his career, but they've tried to get, a bunch of different players to go through there and they rotated their lines again in the last game. So it's really, it's been a little bit more by committee and with Ehlers being out of the lineup and the depth becomes that much more important and we've seen it. So they've, they've really rotated. And it's one of the things that actually I really enjoyed about watching bonus, even though you don't like to see your line switched up too much, he hasn't been afraid to get things going to move, players around whether it be in game or to do or at the start of the game to really try to get the offense going because he mentioned after the game last night in which Sam Gagne was a healthy scratch he'd gone from playing on the top line to to being a healthy scratch and he said you they're difficult decisions that have to be made it's for whatever is best for the team going into that game they have to adjust because of injuries and so for this game Gagne was the odd man out and but whatever they are doing right now seems to be working and that this team even if they've had a bad game they haven't had multiple bad games they've been able to cut it short park that uh, park the bad games and then move on now they'll look for some consistency again though to be able to string together a number of good games in which they're not just winning they're playing the right way they're getting that cliche of that 60 minute effort and uh, continue to, I think, surprise a lot of people with what they've seen so far. 
You mentioned Sam Gagne, Sarah, because it's interesting. Like he, he, you know, he signed very late in the process and was looked to be a, a depth guy, and he filled in roles. That, and and he's a very smart player. Sam Gagne is somebody who thinks the game at a very high level. You know, he's talked about he's had to change his game to be more of a bottom six, but given the opportunity, he can. And then you mentioned he's healthy, scratched. Um, is, is that like is it lack of speed? What what takes him from being you know kind of that roller coaster from you know bottom six, top six, and now out of the lineup? Well, so Bonus described it after the game as really just being a variety of issues. They hadn't been good in the face-off circle. Their fourth line center, David Gustafson, wasn't in the game last night. Um, he was out with an injury, and so they needed someone you know, that could play center. They needed someone that could be um, good in the circle as well. And so it just kind of the way that things trickled down and went through um sam was the odd man out but i mean he's slated in the month of december I believe it's the 20 maybe the 23rd now that he's slated to hit a thousand games he's so smart and he's been one of my favorite signings so far just because he has been able to contribute in a variety of different ways he is kind of that swiss army if he's seen his minutes go up he's being put into positions that they hadn't originally envisioned him having to be in but because of that intelligence and that hockey sense that he has he's been able to adapt and i think he's been a great signing for the winnipeg jets and i expect to see him back in the lineup um, i mean if not on tuesday i expect him to see, see him back in the lineup very shortly Sarah, the last question for me, and I can't let you go without asking about Connor Hellebuck. Um, he's someone that has always struck me as someone that plays with a chip on his shoulder. And I was wondering if the way last season unfolded, not just for the team, but also for his own game, he wasn't bad by any stretch of the imagination, but sort of below the Hellebuck level that we had come to expect. Um, how much do you think that fueled him? And what have you seen from him personality wise, someone that has never lacked confidence shows it again over the weekend with more comments about the um, rule changes that he'd like to see. But I, I just, I think that's part of what makes him so good. Absolutely. And now that he has, you mentioned the confidence and before he had the Vesna, before he put up those numbers, that confidence you would sometimes look at and think, I'm not quite sure where this all comes from um just because outwardly it was always he's very he was always very confident in his game he always felt that he would get to that Vesna um level which he obviously did and he's returned to I think that last season was really challenging him not only with the game that was in front of him but think about COVID that he dealt with I just think that there were a number of different factors that went into it um he's worked on he says getting faster again, getting, and he's just, I don't know if it's, it's not the fundamentals per se, but he has just, he has been back in that zone again. And I know, you know, early on, a lot of people were saying, well, look at the, how much they've had to rely on Connor Hellebuck. Well, I mean, he's a Vesna winning goaltender. He's a part of the team. I, as much as you don't want to make it a heavy workload for him every night for it, that's why you have a goal tender of Connor Hellebuck's caliber to be able to help the team in those situations you know and to be able he needs to be a contributor for it and he has been and he just he has been locked in this season um, I think that he definitely he wants to get back to the level that he was at before he wants to get back into that Vesna conversation wants this to help lead this team and be a key figure in leading this team beyond just the playoffs and beyond just a first round he wants you know the ultimate goal obviously is to win the stanley cup but he's not the only one you two that has that chip on the shoulder i think that going into this season i think a number of players um obviously did not have the season both personally and as a team that they wanted last year that they felt that this was a group that was now being written off that they want to prove something out there but i just i feel as if, if this has this team has a real team feeling to it that just they're all pulling in the same direction and um you know obviously the results have been there 20 games into the season sarah we always like to wrap up with rapid fire and the uh, only rule is you have to answer the question okay oh, this is stressful okay <laughs> all right well we'll we'll start with we'll start with a real easy one for you um 
Shifley Puff Wheeler, trivia. Shifley no, Wheeler okay. and Hellebuck are all UFAs at the end of next season. What is the concern level amongst Jets fans that one, two, or three might leave? Ooh, um, I wouldn't say that right now that it's very high. I don't think that people would expect all three to be back, but I think that um, at this point, haven't heard a ton of concern yet about it. I think people are focused more on this season, but I wouldn't, I would be, I would think that a lot of Jets fans believe that all three won't, won't be back. Who has been the unsung hero who doesn't get a lot of accolades, but has played very well for the Jets? Oh, let's go with, it hasn't gotten, uh, let's go with Adam Lowry. Adam Lowry. Uh, you worked the sidelines for lots of years in the CFL. What is your favorite sideline story that you've never told? Oh, geez. Um, oh, you guys that I've never told. Um, oh. Or maybe told that's still your favorite. The, my favorite sideline story. Um, I don't know. I've, ooh, uh, I don't know. I have awful in pressure situations. Uh, but I did always like the players that we would report had, you know, were out for the game that had gone to the hospital to get checked. Uh, there was one player and all of a sudden he appeared back in the game. He checked himself out of the hospital, took a cab back to the stadium, uh, still, in his, still in his gear and went back into the game. It's like, didn't, isn't he, what, didn't he go to the hospital? What is he doing back here? Yeah, took a cab back and, uh, and went back in. So, uh, Of your fellow TSN um, reporters that you worked with over the years, which one used to ask you for the most <laughs> advice on how to look the best on camera? For their for their Ryan makeup Rashad. specifically. Oh no, sorry. Oh, um, oh, for their makeup specifically. So I'll tell you one quickly. So Paul Apolis, who uh, uh, yeah, so was uh, in the CFL and has been uh, on our on the CFL panel for his first game on site was in Winnipeg and right before the start of the game, it, it, he didn't realize that we don't have makeup on site. Unlike when you're on the panel and you're in the studio and there's a makeup artist there. So just before the game was about to start, he asked where the makeup artist was and he said, we, we don't have a makeup artist. So I had the producer um, in my ear ask me, um, so, uh, hey, sir, uh, do you have any makeup or anything? And can you go up and help Lapo? So, I took my makeup bag up and had to powder him up and and everything like that. But I, there's nothing I enjoy more than seeing panelists go out on site, especially if there isn't. It's, it's rare that a makeup artist isn't there if, if someone from the panel is on site. But it's also it's pretty it's pretty funny to watch how much they uh, they enjoy being pampered. So so basically, you're telling me that the panelists are much more high maintenance than the uh, than the sideline reporters. One hundred percent. No <laughs> doubt about it. <laughs> um, being at the TSN for as long as you did, you covered lots of different sporting events. Is there one sport that you didn't cover that you always wanted to? Mm, Sport-wise, no. You know what? I would love to have done. I would love to have covered. Um, gymnastics at the olympics oh yeah but were you a gymnast as a child i was a child until i became much too tall (laughs) i was just gonna say i like that's a that's a tough one right that's that's a sport that very much uh is a little bit of sizeism it it definitely is when you were i mean when i was um when i was a gymnast and the giants would be five foot one or five foot two, it became clear pretty early on that gymnastics was not, uh, you know, Olympic caliber <laughs> gymnast. I was not. Um, that wasn't the only thing that held me back. Just I have enough self awareness to know that. But uh, yeah, that's always been one of my one of my favorite sports. I spent many many hours pretending to be an Olympic gymnast in the basement as a child. Biggest difference between covering the CFL and the NHL. Um, access typically. Um, so it's just, it's a different, it's a different 
environment right with it. I think that for a variety of different reasons, plus you only have nine teams in the CFL and um, it was one of my, absolutely one of my favorite leagues that I've ever covered, have so much uh, love for the people involved with it. Uh, so I've been in total, I spent almost 20 years covering the CFL. So there wasn't, I just joke that I think other than Richie Hall, there was not a coach left that had played in the CFL that I hadn't covered at some point um, as a player. But the biggest difference, I think, certainly would be would be the access. If somebody's coming to Winnipeg, what is the one restaurant they have to go to? And then what bar should they stop in at? <laughs> Frank will tell you, I am not the person to ask about a bar. What's my, what's my nickname, Frank? Uh, Sarah's nickname when we worked together was Grandma O. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, you must be out for dinner at least, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Sarah. I can confirm Sarah does go to dinner. I do go to dinner. But other than that, yeah, it was Frank used to just send me the emoji of the grandma Yes. For it all the time, because I would always go, this is too loud. It's too, it's too late. It's too this, that. Um, restaurant wise. Oh, there's so many great ones. That's one of the amazing things about uh, one of the best things about Winnipeg. If you are a foodie uh, is that there are so many great restaurants. I would say that um, Clementine, if you like breakfast or brunch is certainly way to go. Um Never go wrong with wasabi for your sushi. Oof. All right. Sarah, thanks so much for joining us as always. We appreciate it. Uh, stay warm and have a have a great month of, uh, I guess, well, November's already over. And then uh, we're, we're a month away, so I can say uh, happy early Merry Christmas. <laughs> well, happy early Merry Christmas to you too as well. And hope to be able to talk to both of you again soon.